Hi, everybody. Thanks, Rachel, for that introduction. Um, so these are our learning objectives up here on the screen. Um, so those are kind of what we'll hope you'll take away from today. Um, but we really wanted to talk on this panel about um, some kind of doing advocacy differently. So a, lo a lot of us as independent patient advocates, we so formed our practices based on a direct one-to-one -one service model where we're providing direct service for one person that pays us to do that service, right? So that's the majority um, of the, the, pro the practices that exist today. Um, but really that precludes just out of necessity, the fact that we have to pay fee for our services, it precludes a lot of people from accessing our work. Um, so we know there's a lot of different uh, barriers to adv accessing advocacy in general. Um, number one is knowing we exist, right? Um, but then also, of course, the financial element. So this isn't, you know, this majority practice isn't a wrong way to do it, of course. It's just um, how most of us have structured what we do. So we know, of course, though, that there's a lot of barriers to accessing healthcare in general. Um, the system is riddled with difficulty um, for accessing, like cost of coverage, treatment, um, accessing appropriate care, and then, of course, socioeconomic factors like um, the systemic issues that are caused, uh, influenced by race, gender, ethnicity, sex, language, religion, education level, and disability. So all of those um, varying range of the spectrum really um, influence people's ability to get the health care they need. So as we're all speaking today, we're asking you to think about how we can structure our practices differently or how we can structure them so we can help people mitigate those healthcare barriers. Um, we're looking forward to your questions and we really think these, important, these are important questions to think about to move our profession forward. So Rebecca is now gonna talk, Stacey's not dead. She's, she's well and alive. <laughs> she wanted us to say that. <laughs> she's not with us today. Um, but no, she's helping her kids get ready for school and um, her teaching. So Rebecca is gonna tell us about Stacy's work. All right, so this is our lovely Stacy. Um, like we said, she's not able to be with us here in person, but she is alive and well. <laughs> she has younger children and this was their first week of school. Um, she's also a professor and she's halfway through the semester. So. Um, I appreciate her trusting us to present this on her behalf. So a little bit about Stacy's journey. Um, she was on track, uh, the professional track, after obtaining her faculty position at Duyuval University in 2010. Little did she know, eight years later, a breast cancer diagnosis would rock her world. Through chemotherapy, radiation, and a double mastectomy, Stacy reflected on how fortunate she felt to have the knowledge in navigating our system. After her treatment was successful in 2019, she was on a mission to better her practice as a pharmacist and earned her credentials as a BCPA. As Stacy navigated the world of independent advocacy, she recognized this traditional model wasn't for her. She just couldn't take off her hat as a pharmacist. So she set out to do things a little bit differently. She began creating educational content in the form of presentations and webinars, sharing her expertise on improving access to pediatric medication information and navigating the pediatric health system. She also provided these presentations for continuing education credits through the Patient Advocacy Certification Board. Anybody has taken her courses? Raise your hand. I have. Um, while many in our field are asked the question, what is the patient advocate and what the heck do you do? Stacy was continually asked, can you please give us some information that's reliable and that will help us make decisions for our kids? She could never give them a single resource, so she created it. Kitakate Rx is in its, uh, on a mission to provide information about children's medication in a patient-friendly, accessible, easy to understand, and reliable format. In keeping patient advocacy at the forefront of its services, Kitakate Rx is able to provide caregivers of children and young people the power to actively participate in their care and the confidence to make medication-based decisions. While Kitakate Rx is just getting started, they plan on doing things a little bit differently than other clinician-led programs. Stacy hopes she will connect with her and follow along the Kitakate journey as it unfolds. And she also wants me to remind you that being an independent patient advocate means keeping that advocate mindset front and center, no matter which service model you use. So I'd like to um, thank you all and then ask Emily to come back to share her story. 
Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to eat. <clears throat> All right. <laughs> so, um, so as Rebecca said, or sorry, Rachel, you're Rebecca. Um, as Rachel said, I have a background in international education. So um, I got my master's in 2015, and I've always been really interested in um, other cultures, you know, wanting to really jump in and immerse myself, learn how, what makes people tick. Um, and then I have had a couple different jobs in that field. Um, most recently, I worked at a resettlement agency in Rhode Island. Um, and then, as Rachel said, back in um, 2018, my mom was diagnosed with uh, brain cancer, and that really g gave us head first. We, it sent us head first into this journey of, you know, chemo, radiation, rehab, stem cell therapy, etc. So we really learned a lot um, firsthand from that experience as a caregiver as well. So, um, kind of combining those two experiences, I realized. There's a lot about the healthcare world that's not medical, and you really need somebody to point you in the right direction and, you know, pull the triggers and make sure that things are working properly and know where to go next. Um, and of course, when you are new to a country and you don't speak the language, you're unfamiliar with the system, it can be particularly overwhelming. And um, there's really nothing in existence that helps people um, follow, f figure out that path. So that's why I founded Navigate Health. Um, my mission is to make sure everybody can understand and afford their healthcare journey, no matter what their socioeconomic background may be. And yep, so that's what I just talked about. <laughs> Um, so I have recently cut, um, secured a contract with the Department of Human Services in Rhode Island. And with that, sir, with that contract, we're working, um, well, I should say I do work one-on-one -on -one with um, clients that pay for my, you know, hourly rate. So I do work in the tr kind of traditional model. Uh, but I also just got this contract with um, Department of Human Services with the State Refugee Resettlement Program. So we're working specifically with the Haitian community right now. Um, people who come in through different refugee statuses, um, they don't necessarily go through the same process with the resettlement agencies. So a lot of these people are kind of falling through the cracks. So with DHS, I'm taking a look at the system and where we do have points of contact with these individuals and how can we convey as much inf information as effectively as possible during those touch points. So we're revising the um, screening process for benefit eligibility um, so that at that point we can get as much information from them and we can give them as much information as possible. And we're developing a pretty extensive referral network. So if people need help with X, Y, Z, we can send them to the appropriate agency to help. Um, so this benefits clients, but it also benefits DHS because they're actually in um, going to be able to remain in compliance with the federal regulations. So it's a really win-win situation. Um, I also have gotten grants from the Department of Health. And so with that, we're working on developing a case management program um, with interpreters. And that is going to be, um, again, for the Haitian community, but um, working with them to secure things like primary care doctors, um, scheduling appointments, working with transport companies, and then interpreters to make sure they get the care they need. Um, one of the things I'm most excited about with that grant is that I'm, um, so I am a certified community health worker. Um, Navigate Health is also an approved Medicaid provider. So we can, community health work is actually reimbursable through state Medicaid. And this is a federal program, like, or it's not federal, but it's a nationwide program. So um, that's a really exciting funding source. And there is a very active um, workforce of community health workers. So we're hiring them to do this kind of groundwork. And um, the community health worker program is, it's really meant to, um, facilitate access to services and bridge the gaps that people need. So that they've recognized this importance, which is why it's a it's a reimbursable service. It's actually like CPT codes and everything for that. So I'm learning the billing side of things, which is a very fun adventure. Um, <laughs> so I have hired one community health worker already, and I'm looking forward to hiring more so we can get more um, more people support. And then in the future, I'm really hoping to get more grant funding so we can do things like um, 
furthering that referral network as well as developing case management. I want to do things like um, cultural orientations for the refugees that come in so that they can understand the basics of their new system that they're going to be thrown into and then also doing provider training so cultural sensitivity trainings how to work with an interpreter um, for these providers because it's a definite <laughs> gap era of knowledge gap and um, kind of developing more uh, reading material you know essentially that we can distribute to people and and help them um, in a culturally and language appropriate way so I'm very excited about that work. And um, I'm really interested in kind of bridging that gap between community health workers and patient advocacy as well, because I think there's a lot of touch points that um, that really make a lot of sense to further. So if you're interested in learning more about community health work, I'd love to talk to you. And I'm now going to hand it over to our, <laughs> our BU Wonder Women, uh, <laughs> Tanisha and Talia. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, we'd first like to start off with an important anecdote. Um, our friend Emma is a student at Boston University, and she's on the rugby team. And during a play, she broke her nose. She was rushed to the ER uh, without any uh, family, guardian, or friend support because she's an out-of-state student. At the ER, uh, the ER staff did not take her nose injury seriously, and she was in a lot of severe pain. Um, she trusted the ER staff and did not really try to raise her voice, and she was sent home. Weeks later, her nose had healed abnormally, and she was rushed back to the hospital so that her nose had to, be, had to have surgery to refix it. A quick fix recovery turned into a months long, thousands of dollars of worth medical nightmare. And Emma's story is not the only one. We have heard several stories from our friends um, at BU and in the greater Boston area who've had similar experiences. And the amalgamation of these stressful and painful experiences sparked our idea and process to develop health care. The Transition into adulthood is no incentive to, for younger adults to start navigating healthcare on, on their own. It's very overwhelming for students to come into college independently and become comfort, com com comfortable with this new level of independence, as well as be, try to navigate health, healthcare, which is a very diverse and complex system. Over 80% of students at BU are out of state, and over 80% of students in the greater Boston area are out of state as well. Over a whopping 25% of students are international students. So clearly students are coming from all over the country, all over the world, and with, away from networks of family and community support, and they are just expected to know. They are just expected to know when to seek medical care, what services are available to them, what, what their insurance plans cover, what questions to ask a doctor. Students are just expected to know how to navigate their own healthcare when they're thrust into a new system. But how many of them actually do? According to a recent study, um, college students ranked themselves lowest in health literacy and how comfortable they felt navigating the healthcare system. And due to this lack of understanding, 50% of college students on average every year seek emergency medical services. And acute conditions evolve into emergency cases. As professionals in the health advocacy sphere, you know that overutilization of the ER is detrimental to the patient, providers, and the entire system as a whole. It creates incredible waste in terms of spending and resources. It takes away attention from individuals who actually need medical attention, and it leaves especially college students stressed and unsure of how the system should work. Further complicating matters, Student Health Services, which is an on-campus medical care provided by the university with its own insurance plans, is often inadequate. The one quick fix alternative to navigating the larger healthcare system often leaves college students in a worse position than they originally presented with. Um, student Health Services are underfunded, they're rushed, 
They often have long waits and the providers are strained. They have limited specialty services, especially in mental health services, which ironically disproportionately affects college age students. And additionally, student health insurance plans are expensive and they severely limit when, where, or how college students can access medical care. So clearly a problem exists in that one, college students need help seeking emergency services, and two, college students are not fully equipped to advocate for themselves when seeking healthcare resources. So we conducted university-wide surveys to understand how universal this experience is. We surveyed over 200 college students in the greater Boston area, and we found that their biggest concerns were a lack of transparency in the services provided by the ER or student health service providers, and they also had a lack of understanding of when to visit visit the ER or urgent cares respectively. So out of the college students that we surveyed, less than 50% felt confident in navigating healthcare. And something that you all might not find that surprising is that many college students had no idea what patient or health advocacy is. And when we asked them to describe it in their own words, they assumed that it was patients advocating for themselves when talking to their healthcare, ad healthcare providers. We then surveyed over 100 parents and their main concerns for their children who are navigating healthcare on their own in college were the lack of appointment availability in student health services, the lack of mental health and therapy resources offered, as well as the sometimes unnecessary and excessive ER visits that are taken uh, by their students. So with this knowledge equipped, we aim to uh, shape healthcare into a service that one, improves healthcare literacy, provides critical assistance to young adults um, and reduces the feeling of transition from childhood to adulthood. And lastly, builds a foundation so that young adults can take charge of their own advocacy. So we, so far we have partnered with BU's Build Lab and we have received funding and grants to take our ideas off the ground. And we're in the process of partnering with BU's Student Health Services so that we can find a way to deliver these services um, in an already existing system that's easily accessible for students. So what are the services that we provide? As many of you know, advocacy needs exist on many levels and are a spectrum. So in order to meet this challenge, we made a tiered approach. Our first tier being a health literacy class where college students will enroll in a series of seminars where they will be taught um, and gain the skills necessary to uh, navigate the healthcare system via communication with patient advocates like yourselves. Uh, the second tier being a one-to-one -one personalized patient advocacy network where they can be paired with a patient advocate who's well-versed in college student needs. And this might be for students who are facing chronic health issues or just need a larger support arm um, like many of the students that we described who are out of state or international. Um, and who need help navigating their own personal, financial, and emotional needs. So as college students um, move into their college era, they're leaving hometowns for new destinations. They're also leaving behind their primary healthcare support networks. Healthcare's mission, healthcare's mission sorry, is to supplement these absent networks and to equip them to become their own healthcare advocate networks when they move into adulthood. That's why we developed the health literacy class as a part of our model. So these classes are built to propel students to seek medical resources on their own and provide them with the healthcare knowledge that every adult in America should have. So this upcoming year, we are aiming to launch a 14 week uh, class, 14 week seminar that um, has one hour weekly sessions that cover a variety of topics such as how to find the right provider, um, in understanding insurance and medical terminology. And if after taking this class, if students need uh, more individualized support, they can uh, be paired with a patient advocate that is trained um, to serve college student needs. And regardless of taking the class or not, they can also be paired with a patient advocate. So why do we feel like this class is important for us um, and for students? So the World Health Organization defines health literacy as, quote, achievement of a level of knowledge, but also confidence to take action. So through these health literacy classes, as well as meetings with uh, patient advocates, we believe students can improve their self-efficacy and have the confidence to take action when they're faced with medical needs. So. Um, health literacy is also a preventative measure. It's key to catching things early, preventing certain ailments, and improving long-term um, life quality while reducing financial burden. 
Another reason this class is really important for college students specifically is because health education is underemphasized. I personally grew up in Florida, and despite having gone to both private and public schools growing up, the only access I had to health education prior to attending college was via a one semester course in the sixth grade where I was warned about alcohol and STIs. And that was the extent of it. <laughs> um, so as previously described, this is a universal experience and it spans across college campuses. Another reason that this class is extremely important is because health literacy has actually been proven to better college student health. A recent article published in the Journal of American College Health found that mental well-being was directly correlated to health literacy skills. And another article published during the COVID-19 pandemic found that um, college student health literacy skills, although overall low, had a protective effect that the article actually described a protective effect when lowering anxiety and stress in college students when present. Um, so it's very important. Healthcare's mission and fundamental goal is to connect college students to healthcare resources and patient advocates like many of yourselves. Um, as discussed earlier, our model comprises of a health literacy course and a service where college students will be paired to patient advocates who are well versed in the specific needs and um, situations that college students have when they come to campus. Um, Emma's story is similar to so many of those across campuses na nationwide because of this lack of health education for the next generation. This general knowledge of healthcare should not be strictly isolated to professionals or gate kept to be learned the hard way. We have the chance to widen the health literate population, starting with college students, who will then go on to positively impact their environments and communities. In the long run, we hope to expand our services outside the greater Boston area and also help high school, the high school student population. Health literacy should not be treated as a commodity. Everyone should have the opportunity to understand their medical situation. Health pair is pairing college students to resources healthcare resources already, and we will continue to do so. Thank you. <laughs> Gee, thanks for being awesome, and how do you go after that? <laughs> Gosh, this is why we call them our Wonder Women from Boston, yeah. Um, so again, I'm Rebecca, um, and I'm thankful to be here to share a little bit about my journey. I've been told that I was crazy for doing this, and what were you thinking, and all kinds of fun things. Um, I've had those same thoughts along the way, don't worry. Um, so before I became a patient advocate, I worked in healthcare, business, accounting, insurance, administration, all the very unsexy and unfun things, cubicle hopping type situation. Um, so after about 15 years, my husband and I decided to grow our family, and we did that through adoption. So we knew in the adoption process, our children had um, pretty complex congenital conditions. Uh, so we were able to use the prep time in the process to um, educate ourselves as much as possible on those specific conditions. Um, what we couldn't do is educate ourselves on how to navigate the pediatric system. So in that first 10 years that we were parents, um, we navigated the health system all alone. Even though I worked in healthcare, I was like, mm, do, 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 right? Because uh, as, as if you know, if you work with pediatric population, the pediatric health system is a system within the system. Um, so we traveled out of state for care. We traveled out of state for major surgeries. Um, and about seven years ago, we actually left our state that we lived in to get the care for our kids. So we have done it all. Um, when they were uh, medically stable, about eight and 10 years old, they w decided they wanted to go to public school. Hooray! Now I can go back to work. <laughs> but I was terrified that their needs would, you know, flare up again. And I'll, what kind of job can I have where I'm traveling out of state for my kids' surgeries? So I thought I would volunteer at a health-related nonprofit uh, that served families of kids with those conditions. That quickly turned into full-time work. <laughs> There was no downtime. Um, I joined their staff um, on their patient education and family education um, advocacy team and fell head over heels in love. Of course, I had, you know, 10 years of knowledge that I wanted to share 
um, with real no no real outlet until this position. Um, so I jumped fully into health policy in DC at all levels of each state that we were had a presence in. Um, and then in 2018, I sat for the BCPA exam. So like many people, the COVID pandemic just kind of threw a real humdinger in there. Yeah. <laughs> so I decided, sure, let's start a nonprofit. That's going to be easy. Um, so September 1st, 2021, uh, I opened ANJ Patient Advocacy, um, and we provide free health navigation, advocacy, and education services, both to children of all ages, um, adult families, and community organizations. So I'm here to talk to you about what I did right and the other stuff. So first of all, I knew um, a couple of things when I started. Um, I really wanted to create a nonprofit specifically so that patients and families did not have to pay for services. Um, where I live in Las Vegas, Nevada, um, it sounds fun and, and exciting and sparkly lights, and it's the, one of the worst healthcare systems in the, in the country. Um, the patients and families that needed the help could not afford it. I was never going to be comfortable asking someone to choose between medication or food and having somebody by their side in the doctor's office. I just, daughter of a social worker and teacher, it just, it's in my blood. Um, so I wanted it to be free for them. I also knew that it had to be a collaborative situation. I'm, I'm one person. I can only do so much. Um, while I do carry a one-to-one -one caseload of about 15 patients, um, I definitely can collaborate with other organizations in the community and reach their constituents in a mass number, right? It's about educating the patients and their families, know where to go, know what to do, know what to ask for. Excuse me. So um, the third thing I knew was that this was going to be a giant learning curve. <laughs> I like to think I'm a smart person. Yeah. <laughs> so I did what any smart person would do, and I Googled it. <laughs> Starting a nonprofit in Nevada. What could go wrong? I got lucky, you guys. I got lucky. Uh, the first search result um, led me to the Nevada Nonprofit Help Center. Didn't know that was the thing. And it's actually at one of the Las Vegas libraries. Happy place on earth. So I went one day, didn't have an appointment, didn't know what to expect. I thought it would just be a special computer I would get a login for and the information would appear. It actually has a couple, uh, st staffed by a couple librarians who were amazing. Uh, they helped make sense of the senseless. Uh, they definitely uh, sat with me hours upon hours upon days, weeks, learning uh, all the federal and state regulations and how you had to operate this nonprofit. The most important thing, I think, was uh, they had an entire database of all the legal forms you would file with like a step-by-step -step forms for dummies, how to get it done and get it approved the first time. Um, so that was super helpful. And my first application for my 501c3, I got approved in a month, which apparently is unheard of. <laughs> so thanks, Library ladies. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I really worked hard on in the beginning was relationships. Um, this is something that comes naturally to me. I've never met a stranger. Uh, my mom says the first time I ran away from home was in a mall because I saw somebody look nice and I wanted to talk to them. I think I was four. I, mm, sorry, mom. Um, so I went to all the places that I did not already know something about. Social security and disability programs, um, Nevada Medicaid and other Nevada funded programs and services, um, and then health advocates with different specialties. Many of you are in the room. Um, going to the social security office and just asking questions is not very fun and not easy. And I did not like it, but I, but I learned a lot. She's telling me I got five minutes, so I'm going to talk faster. And then after I had uh, the administrative part of the nonprofit in process, because it is a process, I spent a couple months, truly hard couple months, spreading awareness. As we all know, what the heck is a patient advocate? Las Vegas is no different. Um, I really leveraged um, anybody that I had heard or read or seen in the media that did healthcare stories. So I emailed those folks at the local news stations and just said, hey, here I am. This is what I do. Some of them didn't reply. Some of them wrote back, hey, good, good luck. You know, let me know how it goes. Uh, 
uh, I also reached out, um, and I can't remember who gave me this advice, so I apologize, I can't credit them. I reached out to the communications staff for the major hospital systems and just kept trying until I got to their, um, the, the team that runs their social media their Facebook pages and everything, and they were a wealth of information. They see everything behind the scenes and know what people want to see and want to hear. Um, and so they just gave me an immense amount of advice in one lunch meeting. Um, and then I was feeling really fancy one day, and I thought I would email some national media reporters on healthcare. Never heard back. Um, the business community has been the most difficult to crack. Um, but I did receive a warm reception from places like the Chamber of Commerce, young professional groups, women in business groups, um, super, super war warm and welcoming. Um, and I left the health community here for last because let's be honest, they might not know what we do, but once we tell them, they're, oh yes, please come in, come in, come in, help. So I went to as many health fairs, back to school events, city events, you know, city ward number six is having a picnic, I'm there, right? <laughs> Free food. Uh, and most of these were no charge to have a table and just and just talk to people. So that definitely went well, the community outreach. Um, by the fifth or so health event I was at, somebody came up to the table and said, hey, I know about you. I wanted to cry, throw up, and keep going all at the same time. Yeah, it was great. Um, so in the last two years, I've uh, continued that outreach in the medical community. Um, school nurses have been huge because I do work with a lot of children. Um, disease specific nonprofits in our town and some national. Um, I actually cracked the wall at a local medical school. And then the public health department um, for Nevada, it actually runs through UNLV. And so I've been able to reach out with them as well. Uh, some of the programs that I offer that aren't programs, but it just came out naturally. Um, I hold monthly office hours at a opioid use disorder treatment clinic, and it's just uh, one Friday a month, four hours, and they can just come in and ask any question, right? So they're not my clients, I'm not taking them on, but I can help point them in the direction. Sometimes it's, I need to get my ID and I don't know what to do. That has nothing to do with what normally a health advocate would do, but that's precluding them from being able to make a doctor's appointment because they can't give them their ID when they check in. So lots of um, little um, steps make a, make a big difference. Uh, one of my most favorite things, and I start back next week, is that I um, connected with a special education teacher at a local high school, and I go and do monthly workshops during the school year for them um, for several classes. Um, of students with autism and some with developmental disabilities, um, just to let them know that they, you know, they're important and they need to have some kind of knowledge and, and autonomy over their healthcare, whether they'll be fully independent or not. So I thank you so very much. I would love to answer any questions about nonprofits. I can't promise I have the answer, um, but yes.